Hey, I'm Nathaniel Foss, and I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, especially in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, this is going to be the third episode of the Archaeology 101 series, which is sort of a modified version of some of the classes and labs that I've taught at the University of Arkansas and at Tennessee. Only here I don't have to worry about things like exams or grades or anything like that. Now, stratigraphy and spatial control are going to be the focus of this episode. So the most basic questions that archaeology is trying to answer deal with change over time. And if we don't know the sequence of events as they occur in the archaeological record, then all of the artifacts in the world are basically meaningless. It's why we dig both in standard levels, usually like 10 centimeter levels at a time, and also keep the layers of soil separated as we dig. If we didn't do that uh, and keep really good records of the soils um, as they are, uh, the soil morphologies that we see, then the entire enterprise of digging up sites is basically pointless. So like, how was a site used? It could have been a hunting camp during some periods, a home base at other times, uh, a cemetery during other time periods. But if we don't have the stratigraphic information of where particular artifacts are coming from within the site, then we have no way of, of saying how the use of that site changed over time. Some parts of the site might have been for cooking during some periods and, you know, textile working for other periods. So if we mix up the soil layers and the artifacts that are in them, we can't figure any of that out. We want to know things like what kind of food people were eating and when. When did people start growing crops? What animals did people eat? And how did those preferences and like what species and what, um, what plant foods, uh, how did those preferences change over time? When does pottery first start showing up? How do the styles of pottery and um, lithics and other kinds of materials, how do those change over time? Did those styles get invented there or was it introduced from some, somewhere else? Um, how were people cooking before they started using pottery? These are the kinds of questions that archaeology is, is trying to, to look at. And this focus on change over time is really one of the things that makes archaeology as a science different from just digging up sites for the artifacts. I think the best way to illustrate that is through the work of Mark Harrington. Uh, Harrington was an archaeologist who was sent to the southern Ozarks region in the 1920s. And at that point, it was already known that the bluff shelters that are in that area had really good uh, artifact preservation. So he went looking for the material that usually doesn't survive in more open air sites, um, things like on floodplains of rivers and places like that. He was looking for things like textiles and bone and wood and, and things like that. So in doing this, Harrington made a massive methodological mistake. He didn't keep any record of the depths that the artifacts came from, really, like level by level, like we would today. And he only recorded what soil context material was coming from when it was found in things like storage pits, where you could, you know, clearly delineate, oh, this is a hole in the ground and they have left, you know, a bag of seeds or whatever in these storage pits. He did notice that things like pottery only came from the top layers of soil in these bluff shelters. So he divided all of these shelters up into only two time periods, which he called the top layer culture and the bluff dweller culture. So this is an illustration over here of what he thought a member of the bluff dweller culture would have looked like. And he's carrying and wearing the kinds of artifacts that his team recovered from the bluffs from underneath that top that top layer, whatever that meant. What he didn't really realize that was that he had mixed up several thousand years of cultural development into one cultural period that he called the Bluff Dweller. And because he didn't pay any attention to the stratigraphy that was within those shelters, he, he didn't publish that report even until 1960. To this day, there are still very few archeologists who work and study the Southern Ozark specifically. And that is in no small part due to the fact that the first people to write about it basically said, yeah, they've got cool artifacts, but nothing changed for like 9,000 years. So there's really nothing there worth studying. And the only, the only reason they believed that to be true was because they were using absolute trash field methods and homogenizing those 9,000 years of cultural development. 
Incidentally, this is why archaeologists usually try to avoid excavating a site if, if we can. We don't want to excavate unless we need to. And when we do excavate, we try to only work on a small area of the site so that we can go back and get more information as our methodologies improve and the kinds of questions we ask become more nuanced. Most archaeological sites have very complex stratigraphy. So stratigraphy are, are those layers of soil as they build up over time. So the, the wind blows sediment in, organic matter will decompose, water will move things around, bring silt in, wash things out. And unless something unusual happens, like a landslide or something like that, the strata that are on the top are going to be more recent than the layers that are on the bottom. We call this the law of superposition. So we have to keep those, those layers separated. We have to dig them up um, independently of each other so that we aren't mixing artifacts from different time periods around. Now to make things even more complicated than that, people, you know, both in the past and in the present, they dig holes on sites that they occupy. So if say like a woodland period person went to a site, they might've dug a house pit or a storage pit and the soil that they dug up, their back dirt pile would likely have some artifacts or materials from an earlier, like archaic time period. And so now that's sitting on top of the woodland ground surface. So we have to watch out for those kinds of disruptions also. And to do that, we typically dig in regular square excavation units. So like one by one meter or two by two meter square units. And this lets us cut clean soil profiles so that we can actually see how the stratigraphy is changing as we're going down. And if we happen to miss a strat break in one unit, then we can recognize that in the profile. And when we dig the next unit that's adjacent to the first one, we can not repeat that mistake as we go down in that one. So soil is made up of three main components. From the smallest to the largest, these are the clay, the silts, and the sands. And they're, they're, they tend to be mixtures of these three. And so as we're digging, we're also noting the changes in the ratios of those components of the soil that we're digging in. We're also looking at things like how loose or compact each layer is, and we have to record uh, like inclusion material, so gravels, how big the gravel is, um, whether it's angular or rounded, things like that. Finally, we also have to note the color of the soil. So for that, we, we use a book called a Munsell book, which is basically a book full of paint chips that we use and we match the color of the soil we're digging to the appropriate standard color code. So we've got a standard way of describing what color soil we're digging in so we can actually see both through texture and through color how the stratigraphies are broken up within an archaeological site. We also have to deal with a process called bioturbation, which basically just means like plant roots and burrowing animals like uh, rats and crawdads and stuff like that. They're going to, as they burrow, drag things around and the, the plant roots are gonna do that too. So we have to keep track of where those root stains are and where the tunnels are as we're, as we're excavating. Now, knowing all that, here is a map of excavations that were done at the mouth of Dunbar Cave in Middle Tennessee. and. You can see that these sediments didn't build up in nice flat layers. They built up in sort of more of a, um, a ridge or a cone shape. The original excavators that dug there dug it in arbitrary 10 centimeter levels, which is a vast improvement on what Harrington was doing, but they still didn't really pay attention to the stratigraphy as they were, as they were going down. So at certain points, there are some 10 centimeter levels that have 15 different time periods that are, are mixed together in that one level. So these kinds of mixed contexts make those original excavations basically useless. You really, you might as well try to like pull out the box of artifacts that your granddad dug up in the woods when he was a kid and try to do anything with those too. The, if there's no spatial or stratigraphic context and none of that stuff is recorded, then we can't really do anything with them. Now, fortunately, after Dunbar was excavated, it was covered over with a concrete slab, so looters can't get to it, and there's plenty of site left that was not, never excavated. So it would be possible, you know, hypothetically, to go back and do another excavation um, in a different section of the site and do it right. Now, unfortunately for the Southern Ozarks, 
the, the damage has been done and it's completely irreparable. For the last hundred years since Harrington worked there, those bluff shelter sites have been dug out by collectors and the stratigraphic context of all of those artifacts can never be recovered. Even when those collections get donated to labs and universities and whatever, there's really not a whole lot we can do with them. I, I've talked before about how much information we got out of a site like Dust Cave because of how precise the methods were um, that, that were used to excavate there. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that hundreds of sites like Dust Cave are now basically useless to science because of the damage that was done to them by artifact hunting. But worse than that, really, is that the people who created those sites in the first place have living descendants that may want their ancestors' stuff back or to have it reburied. So, like, when I work on a site, at a minimum, the tribes in the area have to be consulted. And if we find human remains when we're working, we have to stop work and let the tribes instruct us on how to proceed. And they also then have the ability, because they know what we're finding, um, they're seeing our reports. They have the ability to ha ask to have any materials that we recover repatriated to them, including some of the artifacts. So if you want to be involved with archaeology on like an avocational basis, do it through your local archaeological societies and, and universities so that you can be involved with it ethically. Um, the, the first peoples of the Americas have already experienced profound cultural destruction, and it doesn't do anything for anyone's karma to rob them of their ability to, you know, reinvestigate their own heritage through archaeology if they choose to do so. Once we destroy those sites, they're gone. So I'll end this one there. Um, if you have any questions, you can leave those down in the comments section. And as always, thank you for watching.